don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. Hulk, little smash. This is Robinson. You're trying to seduce me. Here's Johnny. Hey, you never go ass to mouth. Now what is so damn funny? And here we go. We will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. Force will be with you. Always. But the truth! You can't handle the truth! Showtime, everybody! Showtime! What is up, fanboys and fangirls? I'm Chris the Dace Man Dace, bringing you our third edition of the Four Real Movie Club, where today we will talk about summer movies, Jaws, One Crazy Summer, Stand By Me, and Weekend at Bernie's. Joining me this evening, first, Mr. Mike Payton. What's shaking, y'all? Welcome to Mega Powers Radio's Four Real Movie Club. Woo! Woo! And joining us also tonight, Tony Mango. What's up, everybody? Everything that Mike Payton said. Woo! Woo! It's summer! Woo! Summertime, guys, and that's right. That's why we've chosen you a lineup. Yesterday was the first official day of summer. Today is the first official four-wheel movie club of the summer. So, <laughs> we're going to go over movies such as Jaws, One Crazy Summer, Stand By Me, and Weekend at Bernie's. All things that end up on the beach at one point or another, or near some kind of body of water, or a body. So... We'll kick things off with the 1975 classic, Jaws. The American thriller film directed by Steven Spielberg was based on a novel of the same name, the prototypical summer blockbuster. Its release is regarded as a watershed moment in motion picture history. In the story, a giant man-eating great white shark attacks beachgoers on Amity Island a fictional summer resort town, prompting the local police chief to hunt it with the help of a marine biologist and a crazy professional shark hunter. The film stars Roy Schneider as police chief Martin Brody, Richard Dreyfuss as the oceanographer Matt Hooper, and Robert Shaw as that crazy shark hunter Quint. Uh, First off, we're going to go around the panel, and we're going to get your initial reactions to Jaws, if you can remember the first time you saw it. So for me, at least with these movies, I've seen them multiple times. So when you first saw Jaws, we'll start with you, Tony. What was your initial reaction for the movie? I saw Jaws when I was a kid, and I remember at the time thinking that the shark was amazing, and the whole rest of the movie just did not matter. Uh, it was just kind of like, what is this movie? This is uh, yeah, okay. Wait, wait, well, there's the shark. Okay, now we're watching Jaws. Like the whole build up to it, you know, none of that was actually a movie. It was just let's look at a cool shark. And now that I watched it for a second time, I kind of thought the same thing a little bit. But I have a much better appreciation for the setup of the movie as well. Uh, Peyton, what was your initial reactions to uh, Jaws? Well, crap. The first time I saw Jaws actually wasn't the movie. It was the ride at Universal Studios. And I was a little kid of maybe six years old, and it scared the living shit out of me. (laughs) So I didn't bother seeing the movie until I was way older, probably like 16 or 17. Um, and then after I saw it, I uh, I was not as scared. <laughs> it was not scary at all. <laughs> of course, I guess by that age it shouldn't be. Um, I had a tough time watching it just because it's old. But I, I don't know if I want to get into this now. But I have a theory about movie making. And it's that there's a distinct period in movies where they got better and where they were really stupid. And that's at the point where Jaws was made. I think any movie before Jaws is that old version of storytelling where you're going things really slow and all the shots are really wide and there's not all this excitement going on, all the stuff that hold over from the 30s. Jaws changed it up and made it to the style that is pretty much stuck around all the way until today. Maybe it got shifted around the 2000s a little bit, but they, they cemented that. And I'll always say when someone's telling me about an old movie, like, did it happen before or after Jaws? And that's all I need to know to know if I'm probably going to like it or not. And Jaws is just right in the middle. You know, it's got that slow time in it, but then it's also got a lot of this excitement as well. So it's it's a tough movie to judge in that regard. For sure. I, I remember the first time that I saw the movie Jaws, uh, I, like you said, I was younger, and it was it was terrifying. But to go back and watch it now, um, I don't know if I would be so much as terrified as if I was just, you know, kind of surprised that the shark didn't show up till the end. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Jaws filming is that the they had several robotic sharks 
of which they won, they lost at sea, and the others kept breaking down, and actors were having problems uh, cooperating with the machine. So therefore, they decided to uh, start shooting at the perspective of the shark itself. That's why we don't really see the shark till the end. Uh, and during the first initial scenes with all these actors uh, that are killed off, that's why we just see it from the shark's perspective. Um, on that note, and we'll continue with you, Mr. Payton, um, what did you think of the camera, the, the choice of shooting the camera angle from the shark's perspective for at least, I would say, the good first half of the movie? You mean for the fact that we only saw the fin? The fin, and at most times you would see the camera coming up to the victim rather than seeing... Oh, like, like a POV. Yeah. Uh, this was something that was really big, once again, in the older horror movies where you would not see the monster till the very end. And we don't get very often today. I think the closest thing we got today was the newest Godzilla movie where people hated it for that fact that you didn't see the monster until the end. Uh, people can't take suspense anymore, and for me, I liked it, but I think for the general movie going public, this is one of those signs of the older times that people are not going to like too much. For sure. Uh, Tony, what, what was your thoughts on the camera angles that were used within the movie Jaws? I think it kind of makes the movie. Um, you start off in the first scene, and it's a real playful scene. You know, the, the hippie chick's taking her top off, and they're having fun, they're drunk, they're stumbling around and all that. And it's kind of, even though this is a morbid thing to say, it's kind of fun to be the shark in that moment because you're like, ah, yeah, fuck you, I ate you, with like that kind of thing. <laughs> but then throughout the movie, you start seeing, you know, he kills the kid, and you're really like seeing a lot of other vicious things happen. And then it gets disturbing that you're in the shark's perspective because you know what's going to happen next is you're going to see, you know, a limb torn off or something. And um, uh, we were talking about the the idea of um, modern movies doing this. I kind of agree with the people that said that the the Godzilla movie could have used more Godzilla. I don't think that this tactic worked with that movie because that was sort of building itself on being a Godzilla movie instead of being a movie about a monster. But one movie that is pretty recent that really pulled this off well, I think, was Cloverfield. Uh, we talked about it before on 4 Movie Club, but the idea that you don't see the monster for too much of the movie... Um, that helps build that suspense. So the same thing with Jaws. Um, if Jaws would have just been a normal shark like the Anaconda movies or something like that, I don't know if I would have been as uh, freaked out about it. Another interesting note uh, about this movie is it was more or less Steven Spielberg's first break into the movie field. So he he was also handed a lot of challenges. Uh, the film had trouble production going over budget and past schedule, as which was originally planned. Uh, like we said, there was multiple malfunctions with the shark itself. He had to deal with uh, two actors who didn't like each other off screen, who was uh, uh, Richard Dreyfuss and Roy Schneider. Um, hmm. They didn't really get along from stories that have been so, uh, told about the production itself. With all that in mind, and Tony, I'm going to ask you first. How did you feel Steven Spielberg did for his debut, well, more or less the film that got him on the map? Uh, exceptionally. There was a reason why Jaws is always brought up as uh, a classic movie. I think a lot of classic movies are kind of overhyped and people just buy into them because they're uh, referred to as classic movies. But there's a select few that um, it seems like anybody who watches it, they will agree that justifies itself being on that list and this is one of those movies um if you look at the career of spielberg and you start listing off you know the the quote-unquote greatest spielberg movies everybody mentions jaws eventually and i think it's a uh, it's justified uh Peyton, same question steven spielberg is my favorite director of all time and if you ask me what my top five favorite movies were for him jaws actually would not be in there but it being so vital, not just to launching his career, but as I was talking about before, changing the movie industry in, in itself is, is huge. And watching this movie in itself, you may not appreciate everything that you're watching, but its significance for the history of filmmaking is so important. And I, I, I assume, I'm not 100% sure on this, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but I, I would have to imagine this is one of those movies that's been preserved in the Library of Congress in uh, 2001. Um, so, some other interesting facts about the movie. The, the most infamous line that came from it, you're going to need a bigger boat, was in fact improvised by Schneider or Scheider as he was chumming. And 
it, to me, it resonates so much. That that line right there where he backs up, slowly p- goes into the cabin where Quint's sitting and says, you're going to need a bigger boat. I, I, uh, this is a wrestling term, but I marked out for that moment. Crazy. Um, what we're going to do right now is, uh, and we'll ask you, Peyton, what was the high point of the movie for you when it came to Jaws? Uh, the high point of the movie, and I hate to say this, is actually at the end when the, the shark dies. <laughs> I, I, I think just the, uh, the heroics of that guy, he's falling down the boat towards the shark's mouth and able to pull himself out of that situation and get the kill. I, I think a- after seeing the destruction that the shark has done the whole movie, it was, it was a great story. You know, um, this was actually a book originally, and I think one of the complaints that we have about this is that it's really slow in the beginning. And I never read the book, but from what I read about the book is that it's even slower. Like, you don't see the shark until the last hundred pages of what's a pretty sizey book. Mm-hmm. So when they wrote the screenplay for it, they basically went up to the writer and was like, hey, we just kind of like this part. So we're just going to use this, and we're going to write everything else on our own. <laughs> Uh, Tony, what was your high point of the movie Jaws? I actually kind of have to disagree about the ending a little bit because what bothers me about it is when you get that satisfaction, and this is something that bothers me about any movie that does this, the shark is killed and maybe a minute and a half goes by and the movie's over. It's like, uh, you know, the the shark's killed, Dreyfus goes up and he's just kind of like, hey, cool. And then it's just like, so I want to go back to the beach? Yeah, sure. Credits. <laughs> like. That takes it away from me. I think actually the best part of the movie is the build up to that. Just um, the idea that every once in a while you're getting nervous that another person is going to die and the shark is going to come back. And every little nuance throughout the movie where somebody, um, I don't want to say uh, disagrees with the idea that the shark's killing people because they know it, but like they they try to um, ignore the issue and. That one guy, I can't remember the character's name, but uh, the one who's overseeing the whole town and he's really concerned with the 4th of July festivities, when you can get annoyed with him that it's just he's ignoring it and eventually it's going to come bite him in the ass metaphorically. Uh, but um, I think that that's actually the highlight of it. It's just sitting through the whole thing and wondering what's going to happen next. Awesome. Uh, when it comes to casting in Jaws, um, some other actors were actually up for the role originally of Hooper. Uh, some names that were thrown out there were John Voight, Joel Gray, and Jeff Bridges, but for whatever reason they turned down the role, which ultimately was landed with Richard Dreyfus, who will actually be in another movie that we will talk about this evening. Um, and the other role of Brody, or the detective Brody, they considered using Charles, Charlton Heston for the role of uh, Officer Brody. Um, Spielberg decided to go with another actor. Heston was reportedly so furious that he refused to ever work with the director again. Um, when it comes to casting, and we'll start with you, Tony, how do you feel... Um, do you feel the roles were... Per- do you feel the actors were perfect? Would you, would you have changed anything, anyone else you might have put in there? Uh, you know what? I think that they pretty much hit the nail on the head. If Heston would have been in the Brody role, I don't know if I would have bought it as much. Because part of the reason that that ending has a little bit of satisfaction behind it is because Brody's kind of a wimp throughout the movie. He doesn't really seem to do much. He doesn't stand up for himself as much as he should. He doesn't assert his uh, authority over the people that he should. And it takes until that very last uh, push for him to kill the shark, and then it's just like, I did it. They even built in a thing that he's afraid to be on the water. So if Heston would have done that, man, I don't know, I would have believed that. I would have thought that he would have gone out with a knife and just killed the shark or something. <laughs> just swim and just be like, here, fucking, I'll use a stick and kill you. Um, Heston would have been better in the part that um, Shaw was, if anybody. But Shaw did it perfectly well, too, because he's a despicable person in the movie. And when he dies, I mean, um, obviously you're rooting for him not to die. But when he does, it's just like, it's okay. It would have been different if Dreyfus would have died. Mm-hmm. But let alone Dreyfus uh, in the movie, he's an ass. He's a little pipsqueak. Yeah. <laughs> and he pulled that off really well, too, because I would be angry as all hell if I was dealing with him, just like everybody else is throughout <laughs> the movie. 
an interesting note about the Dreyfus character, Hooper. Uh, originally in the script, he was intended to die, but the shark footage that they used with the cage, apparently uh, the shark, St- Spielberg liked how well it meshed that the shark got in the cage and banged it up. And the the, the footage was awesome to the point where the, the scuba diver escaped. They just stuck with that, and that's why Hooper ended up li- uh, living in the huh. film. Um, Peyton, what were your feelings on the casting? Casting was fine. I, I When you bring up a name like Charlton Heston, I, I completely agree with Tony. Heston was way too much of a badass, especially at, at this point of his career. If you had him out there, he would have just... <laughs> I'm picturing just as Tony said, having a knife in his throat. You damn dirty sharks! <laughs> oh, yeah, stabbing to death. I Get your jaws things. off me, you damn dirty sharks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think all the casting was fine. I think it's great that, at the time, these are all relative unknowns, which is the smartest thing you could have done in film at the time, um, especially with an unknown director like... Steven Spielberg, and this was a movie that made a lot of careers for people. Uh, who knows? Maybe that mechanical shark would not have a career. Uh, <laughs> I did not care for the sequels, by the way. I don't know if we're going to be talking about those, but I guess we'll get more into that later. The, um, the the hardest thing for the actors, I think, was the fact that the script was really weak, and the fact that this movie made, made it to be so well on such a weak script, because throughout this whole movie, all the dialogue sucks. <laughs> All of it, and and that's actually one of the things that was another big problem with this movie. You're talking about there being tensions between actors and going over budget. One of the problems is that they just cannot find a decent goddamn writer to make the script sound good. Um, the the whole idea of going after the shark was fine, but the conversations between people was so wooden, so unrepresentative of what you would want these people to be talking like. Everyone was way too old for the part that they were in. I, I just was not that part. That part did not get me immersed into it. So I don't know if it's necessarily the actor's fault. I think that's more on script writing. But acting is not the top-notch thing you're going to see this movie for. For sure. I mean, it's funny, too, because the most infamous line was improv. So <laughs> it's further proving that the script itself was kind of kind of rough. Um, another interesting fact before we leave the cast co- part of this conversation, uh, Robert Shaw, who plays Quint, was not the original choice for Quint. Uh, in an ironic note, the original actor got into trouble with the IRS and had to flee the country. Later, after Jaws had debuted in the cinematic theater, Shaw had himself had IRS troubles and had to flee the country. So it's interesting to note that that happened with him. And he also mm-hmm. apparently had a drinking problem during the filming progress of so, uh, production. So that's another reason why there was delay and there was problems and, you know, most of the time, I would imagine he was improv because he was batshit crazy in most of the film. Um, Peyton, you talked a little bit on it um, a few minutes ago during when we were talking about casting sequels. Um, Jaws did go on to have several sequels. Um, and as all horror movies that have sequels, it, they kind of get bad as <laughs> they go along. Um, and they also get 3D. Yeah. <laughs> As long as, I mean, they didn't go the route of uh, Jason. He didn't end up in space for whatever reason. Oh, I, uh, I would love Jaws in space. <laughs> oh, swimming in space with a big uh, that, that astronaut helmet on. <laughs> Somehow still eating people. I like to think just for my own personal, like, happiness, he made a cameo appearance in Sharknado. Mm. So that that's one thing I hope for. He didn't get credited for it, of course, because they don't want to spoil it for the fans on IMDb, but I'd like to think Jaws made an appearance in the Sharknado. Um when it comes to sequels, uh, Mr. Payton, what were your thoughts? Uh, obviously it sequels in horror are very hard to do. I disagree with that statement because I think series like Halloween and even Freddy Krueger to an extent have made excellent sequels. Um and more recently you got movies like Saw, which People seem to love the sequels more and more every single time one of them comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Jaws, though, not the case. Maybe they just haven't perfected that that chemistry down yet. They didn't know how to make a good horror sequel. All of them were terrible. I and mean, when you start putting someone like Dennis Quaid into your movies, you know you're not taking them as seriously anymore. Uh, Dennis Quaid. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Jaws 3D especially is the one I'd like. I always remember this one specific scene in Jaws 3D where the shark like swims into a piece of glass. It's like a completely still shark, no no movement on it whatsoever, no sh- 
Muto fins shaking around, just 100% like plastic toy shark swims into what's supposed to be a window, and you see it move, and it like just stops in midair for a second, doesn't move at all, and then like half a second later, it cracks. The glass cracks, and that's the effect they went for. It's like, that was awful. <laughs> like, I could have done a better effect than that. And yeah, granted, it was 1983, but... Ugh. And even back then, anytime you try to do something in 3D, it just comes off hokey, and it ruins the whole movie if you try to watch it in a normal experience. And of course, you can't watch it in 3D either, because 3D technology back then, with the, the blue and red glasses, you think the new ones hurt your eyes? Try watching a whole movie with those freaking things on. <laughs> Uh, Tony, what was your opinions on the sequels that followed? Oh, they were so bad. <laughs> oh, God, there's no redeeming quality about them whatsoever. I mean, you've got the idea that other sharks are the same size as this one monstrosity that nobody's ever fucking seen before, and that they have a grudge against the family. <laughs> like, these sharks all talk to each other and went, yo, get the fucking Brodies. <laughs> they killed <laughs> Bruce, man. <laughs> And, God, they're just... The acting's even worse. The the writing for everything's worse. And killing this shark, they tried to give him gimmicks and stuff, and that came off worse. The movie, uh, the, this first movie here, has a pretty effective way of killing the shark. I mean, you set up the idea of the compressed air, he shoots it, it blows up. Okay, that's something that's, while it's not, you know, going to happen on a daily basis, it's relatively reasonable. Other ones are bringing in fucking electrical impulses and crap, and it's like, I forget which one it was. I think it was number four. I uh, specifically remember seeing as a kid where they were doing that electrical impulse thing, and they just keep flashing like a light bulb at the shark, and it's just like, ah, ah, that hurts. No, whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, the shark has epilepsy. Oh. Right. <laughs> as a kid, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? How is this hurting a shark? Like... If you could just turn a light switch back and forth and it kills these animals, why the fuck are they still alive? <laughs> they are, are terrible. There's no redeeming quality whatsoever about these sequels. And it's a shame that they exist, because if it would have just been the one Jaws movie, maybe there wouldn't be as many jokes that you can make about it. But goddamn, Jaws 2, the only good thing about that is the tagline, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. That is amazing. Everything else from all three of those other movies... <laughs> Just get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'd like to touch upon before we go into our final thoughts on the movie Jaws is is its legacy. Uh, like we said, this is Spielberg's uh, debut, fi- like big heavy hitter film, and it, it was made. It's one of those things that's often referred to when talking about uh, movie history, as well as it was added to the Cong- uh, Congressional Library in 2001. Going around. We've seen influence uh, from Jaws to many other movies in the future. Tony, I'll start with you. What huge legacy impacts have you noticed through other film between when Jaws first debuted and today? I think not only um, is there some kind of a legacy when it comes to just filming tactics and people trying to replicate that and stuff, but I think that one important thing to throw out there is just how people were such fans of it that it's become one of those movies that's a cult classic. There's uh, two examples that come to my mind of people that reference things just because they love Jaws, and that's, uh, there's a line in the movie, that's some bad hat Harry, which Brian Singer named his production company, Bad Hat Harry. That's entirely from Jaws. Uh, the movie Mallrats from Kevin Smith, a follow-up to Clerks, the two main characters are Brody and Quint, the two characters from Jaws. Uh, people... Uh, have named characters Bruce when they are referring to Jaws, who's that's the name of the shark. People try to make references to the music, because the music is one of the, the key things throughout this movie. That's something um, I should have mentioned earlier with the, the highlights of it. Uh, anytime you hear, like, dun 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 any kind of variant of that, people are referencing Jaws. And whether it's the the means of filming a monster movie or doing suspense in general, or just, you know, throwing out a reference like the, the bad head Harry and the Quentin Brody things from being a fan of it. Jaws is a movie that really uh, is on that list of those hundred or so movies that you just have to see at some point in your life, because you might not love it. You might not think it's the most entertaining movie in the world or whatever, but guaranteed you're going to take something out of it and you'll be able to have so many more conversations about movies from that. Peyton, what was your thoughts on the legacy of Jaws? 
Well, we already talked about how excellent Steven Spielberg is, but most importantly for this, I think, is that this is where Steven Spielberg hooked up with the man that is John Williams. <laughs> and as Tony said, they made that iconic theme, which you just hear everywhere. Like, you watch SpongeBob, you hear the Jaws theme. You watch uh, Saturday Night Live, you're hearing the Jaws theme used for something. It's, it's so iconic with something evil creeping up at you. And these two would go on to work with each other all the way up until today for decades and just making amazing film and sound combinations that complement each other so goddamn much. Um, Jaws as it's mo- as a movie, as we said, it's it's not the greatest thing, in, but I think it's a lot like reading Shakespeare where you got to go to the basics and you got to know where everything came from because just like most stories are written off of something that Shakespeare wrote, most modern movies are based off of a lot of the techniques that Jaws started. So when you can go back and see where they all came from, it makes you appreciate a lot more what you see these days. And I think if someone went back and saw that, they could really, really appreciate a lot more of these modern action slash horror movies that we have, um, like the modern War of the Worlds or something like that, to see how far things have changed. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're, coming, we're winding up on our 30 minutes here for Jaws. We'll go around uh, between you guys. And we'll just get your final rating between 1 and 10 on the movie. 1, it was terrible. Throw it away. 10, rush out and go see the re-release that's happening now in your in the local theater. Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Payton. What was your th- final thoughts and scale 1 to 10? Uh, well, as, as far as just like an opinion of a movie overall, I would put it at like a 7.5. Uh, you know, around that three-quarter mark. But I am going to put the asterisk next to it saying that still you have to go see it. I'm not going to give it the 10, but it's still a movie that everyone needs to see. And if you have the opportunity to go see it in theaters, there's not a lot of great movies coming out this summer. Uh, there, there's a lot of energies that are being held over until the next. So why not spend one of your movie weekends going to see Jaws? And Tony, same question. One to 10 and your final thoughts. I pretty much have to echo the same thing. I don't know if I would recommend it to somebody as a 10 just on its uh, own merits. And just go, oh, you got to watch this movie because it's, you know, uh, you'll love it. You'll watch it over and over and over again. I'd probably go around like a six, seven or so. And I have to do the same asterisk. It's a 10 when it comes to you have to see it, though, because if you're going to be somebody who converses about movies, you have to see Jaws. It's just like you have to see Citizen Kane. You have to see The Godfather. You have to see, uh, you know, any of these iconic movies. Jaws is one of those. You have to see it. Awesome. Uh, Thank you for that. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that was our conversation on Jaws. What we're going to do next is roll into our next film here on the Four Real Movie Club. For those of you that are listening live, remember you can dial in at 760-512-7247, discuss the movies with us. And for those of you that are listening on the archive sessions, because you didn't listen to us today, which was June 22nd, um, click over to the next video and hear us talk about One Crazy Summer. So our next film on the list is One Crazy Summer, uh, which is a 1986 romantic comedy film written and directed by Savage Steve Holland and starring John Cusick, Demi Moore, Bobcat Goldwith, Curtis Armstrong, and Joel Murray. Uh, The original film score was composed by Corey Lerios. To give you a plot summary real quick, uh, it's about a teen named Hoops who has just recently graduated high school and failed to get a basketball scholarship that his parents were expecting him to get. Uh, Hoops hopes to admit uh, to Rhode Island School of Design and must write and illustrate a love story for his application. He joins his friends George Calamari um, and George's sister Squid to spend the summer on the island of Nantucket, Massachusetts. En route, they pick up a young rock star named Cassandra Eldridge, uh, who is being chased by a motorcyclist gang at the time. On the island, Ho- Hoops, George, along with George's island friends and the Stork Twins and Akak Ramon, or Akak Raymond, must help Cassandra save her grandfather's house from the greedy Beckerstead family, along with the way Hoops must find the way to write his cartoon love story. So besides the, the fact that there are terrible names throughout this entire film, including the high school he graduated from was Generic High, um, uh, in their defense, there actually is a city called Generic New York. Oh, is there really? Yeah. <laughs> Those people are dumb. Just the kidding. first time I saw it, too, I was like, <laughs> wait, are, are they really being so lazy just to call it Generic High School? And they said, in Generic New York. I was like, oh, wait, that place actually exists. I have seen it. <laughs> um, 
what we'll do is we'll go around. I really feel like this will be the shortest segment of the Four Real Movie Club tonight. <laughs> uh, we'll start with you, Tony. What was your first thoughts on One Crazy Summer? I could not finish it. I tried to watch it, and I got about a half hour in, and I was just like, God damn it, there's 30 plot lines going on of... Uh, I, you know, I'm hoops, I play basketball, but I'm an artist, but I need a girlfriend, but I gotta get into college, and my car sucks, and here's a chick, and she's in a band, but there's a little girl with magical powers, and, like, we're gonna build some restaurants, and I'm like, what the fuck <laughs> is this? Oh, and there's Bobcat Goldthwait, like, <laughs> just, I, I couldn't take it. <laughs> I couldn't take it at all. Mr. Payton? Unfortunately, I'm in the same spot. I did not make it through much more of this movie. I think the reason I made it further is because I did two attempts. <laughs> I got like about 15 minutes in the first time and then maybe another 20 minutes the second time. Uh, this this was just typical 80s schlock. Uh, I don't know where this fell in the timeline of the career for John Cusack, but I have to imagine he was just the it thing at the time, so they wanted to get him in another movie. The rest of the cast sucks. The, the jokes are terrible. Uh, I don't think this movie had an idea of what kind of comedy style it wanted to be because sometimes it was comedy that was grounded in reality and then sometimes it had Looney Tunes type comedy, which completely takes me out of the moment in a live action movie. I never think that that kind of cartoony comedy is going to work in a live action movie. And there's been people who have made lectures about why that kind of comedy doesn't work in live action movies. Uh, so the, I just could not follow this movie. It, 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 it was, I don't know. Maybe I had to have been born in the 80s. And you know what didn't help is the fact that the... I don't know if it was just the quality of the rip I got, but this was in such piss-poor quality. It was so grainy. All the characters were fuzzing into the backgrounds. It was tough to watch. I, I'll have to admit on that. When you, when you go to purchase this on the uh, Amazon stream, uh, they don't offer it in HD. So they, they stopped caring about this movie. Um, despite the, uh, the, the original director... The director of the movie... His original film was Better Off Dead, which was his debut. Uh, the New York Times wrote, in spite of the director's flair uh, for zany humor, the film is just absurd. Uh, but they said it was, uh, the Chicago Reader said it was not a bad film and certainly more polished than Holland's Better Off Dead debut. Though it's married by unevenness and the director's inerratic, I can't say that word, penchant for, he's a jerk. I can't read these words. How can, you, how can you put that many big words in a row? What the yeah, fuck? Yeah, that's unfair. <laughs> Come on. People who are watching this movie aren't going to be able to read those words. <laughs> like yours truly. Um, but still, the film maintains a 60% score on Rotten Tomatoes. And at the box office, it, it, it gained $13 million. Um, John Cusack. Yeah. The <laughs> running time was 89 minutes, and it debuted August 8th of 1986. Um Besides the first initial and, uh, like, you guys you guys can barely get through it, uh, it was tough for me to get through it again. I've seen it a couple times as a kid. It, to me, it resonated more for me to sit through it because, you know, there's cartoons, uh, there's Bobcat making weird noises, and just, you know, kind of zany humor going on. Um, and that's kind of what I was going to go to is the characters themselves. Uh, for what you guys did see, and we'll start with you, Peyton, um, did you feel there was too many? Did you feel that the characters were too over the top? Uh, what, what was your feeling on the casting slash characters? Well, I'm going to contradict myself because people may or may not know I am a huge, huge fan of Game of Thrones. And that show is notorious for having like 20 concurrent storylines going on with 100 different freaking characters and a new one being introduced every week and one dying every week. So you constantly got to be on your game of who these people are and what they're doing. Game of Thrones? Huh? Exactly. <laughs> so, so you'd think I would be good at following that kind of stuff, but maybe that just works more in a political drama and less so for a quote-unquote romantic comedy that doesn't have any romance or comedy in it. Uh, <laughs> um, There's your tagline. <laughs> I said it before, and I'll say it again. I think this was just slapped together because they had a few it people. John Cusack was a big deal in the 80s. Demi Moore was becoming a big deal. Um, who was the fat guy? Uh, Joel Murray. Joel Murray? Who the fuck is he? He, he, is played, he played uh, Fitz in the, the CBS comedy uh, sta uh, Still Standing mm. later on, like 20 years later. The, the best part of the whole movie, I think, was Bobcat Goldthwait. Yes. For the two scenes, I got to see him. I thought that was, I actually wanted to see where that one went. 
but unfortunately there was all that other garbage in between. Um, the little girl was kind of cool too. I was intrigued to see what she had up her sleeve. I think if this was just a, a movie that was about this family and less so focusing on what was going on with John Cusack and this girl, I, I would have enjoyed it more. If this was more just like a, a zany meet the Goldbergs type experience, maybe I would have gotten into it. But the, the way it was, the, the whole love story was what was the worst and those stupid freaking cartoons with the rhinoceros. Fuck those. <laughs> uh, Tony, what was your feeling on the casting and overall like barrage of characters? I kind of have to agree that they probably just said, you know, Cusack, somebody right now, we'll put him in there. This Joel Mary guy, we could get him real cheap. Uh, Demi Moore, she's hot, let's get her. Like, uh, they don't, they don't seem like they had much going for that. Um, character wise. I don't know if I would say the same thing, though, as much. Uh, the, the two scenes or so that I had seen from Bobcat Goldthwait, he just sort of reminded me of uh, the type of guy that you, you put into a movie because you think he's a comedian, he'll make it funnier, and you just tell him to do stuff, and you don't really have like an actual set of dialogue for him to say. So that bothered me. And the person that I actually was the most interested in seeing throughout the whole movie was the quote-unquote villain of the movie that douchebag kid i thought that he was like the most intriguing character out of the whole thing because he was the one that i believed was playing a part everybody else was just like oh cusacks you know he's getting a paycheck and uh it, to me more is just kind of sitting there looking because that's all she really had done um but he seemed like he was actually trying to bring an actual character to it so that was interesting i have no clue where that turns up <laughs> if he ends up actually <laughs> being terrible throughout the rest of the movie or not but um i gotta agree about the the, the weird cartoon and uh, how you're bouncing around all over the place one character that was bothering the hell out of me was that little girl i did not <laughs> think that that was uh something that i really wanted to pay attention to did, did she have powers is that the thing I I don't know where you're getting that. I got no impression that she has powers. Cause she, I just had the impression that she had a ratty dog. Well, they did the thing with the the faces. If you um somebody slaps your back when you are making a face, you'll stick like that forever. And then the girls literally stick like that forever. That, that that was like a thing in the '80s. That was like a thing parents told their children. Yeah, but like <laughs> the, the, she somehow got it to work. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, no. Well, she slapped her back. That's like you know made their muscles tense up and made their face stick like that. She just turns out to be like a vindictive bitch that uh, if you made fun of her dog, she got you back. Oh, you know who else sucked? Those those two retards. <laughs> and I feel terrible for calling that, but that's exactly what the movie portrays them as. This movie has like no political correctness today. <laughs> oh, no. Like there was that point where they like the heat the scoutmaster just hands the kid a gun yeah. and the kid goes <laughs> off and you hear the gun explode. He's like, kids, tourniquet. <laughs> you could not put that in a movie. Today. Was that booger? Yeah, uh, Booger. Yeah, Booger was in this movie. I would, that that was one of the more enjoyable people in the way that I got to see Booger. I'll give credit to the one joke that uh, that made me kind of chuckle was when they, he's picking up the shells. And oh, it's of course you just like that one. Well, because it's a pun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea that it was like can't you just wait until they're done. Yeah, but like, like why would an airbase be having bombing practice on a beach <laughs> <laughs> on an island? So it's it's a small little island. And they're bombing the hell out of one of their beaches. It's generic bomb beach. And uh, I don't know, I got the feeling with that joke and with a bunch of the other ones that they sort of wrote this as like, we've got this vehicle of, we can make a movie. What do we make? All right, well, I had this joke from this other movie that we couldn't do. I had this joke from this whatever. Let's just put them all in there. Let's just go like, okay, you're in a bathroom and you find money and then you go and there's a bombed beach and boogers there and like... Um, one of the things we talked about in our previous uh, topic that we've done tonight uh, is the legacy of Jaws. And one thing that's done in this movie itself is a parody of Jaws uh, called Foam 2, a dolphin with rabies, <laughs> which actually they go to the well and they get the theme for Jaws on their soundtrack for this. In aspect, as we were talking about legacy with the movie Jaws, how did you feel about that parody of Foamy the Dolphin, and I, I don't know if you guys said it, didn't make it to the end. He ended up showing up in the, they had like a regatta race, and Foamy the Dolphin shows up, driven by this demonic little ginger, and eats one of the bad guys. Like, kills him? <laughs> he doesn't kill him, he gets stuck in him, and he's screaming that he's going to get the kids, like, Scooby-Doo style. Um, <laughs> and the girl pops out the fin and just waves, 
and it drives off into the distance with the guy in the mouth of the dolphin. Uh, when it comes to legacy, do you think this hurts Jaws for even being allowed to be in this type of movie? Or just makes Jaws that much better because a movie this ridiculous had to go to the well to get some kind of credibility? Uh, we'll start you with Peyton. <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> I, I, I definitely don't think it hurts Jaws because I think so many people would have seen Jaws and not seen this movie. And watching this, I don't see that. It makes me think less of Jaws. No, I, I just think less of this movie for having to stoop to that level. And it wasn't even, like, clever. Like, yeah. this dolphin with rabies. It's not even funny. Um, as far as using the theme, I'm trying to look into that and see why that was. They're, <clears throat> they're not distributed by the same company or owned by the same company, so they must have actually had to throw down money in order to get that. To mm-hmm. actually spend some of their budget, which I can't imagine was all that much, just to get that <laughs> theme. So uh, props for going all the way. Oh, holy crap, I didn't know Jeremy Piven was in this movie. Yes. He was the handler of the retards. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> no, that's uh, all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, I didn't expect us to have much on this. Uh, it, it's a very simple 89-minute movie from the 80s, which is just... That should just sum up the movie for you. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go around real quick, get the final thoughts on this movie. Uh, and what you would rank it on a scale to 1 to 10. If it gets higher than a 5, I'd be really surprised. Uh, we'll start with you, Tony. Final thoughts uh, and 1 to 10. Uh, this is a total 9. Um, <laughs> 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 no, this um, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. Uh, I'm really curious. Uh, I wish I could kind of like go back in time, pop over to your house, Dave, and see you watching this movie and being like, yeah, look at that. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, all bad thoughts about this. Um, I tried giving it a shot because, you know, you never know if someone's going to make you laugh. Uh, I've seen a lot of movies that I thought were going to be terrible, and I actually liked them a lot. I've seen a lot that I thought I was going to love and I hated, so it was always worth a shot, but I would definitely recommend everybody stay away from it. (laughs) Baden, uh, your final thoughts? Uh, Oh, Tony, 1 to 10. Oh, uh, 2. (laughs) <laughs> uh, paid 1 to 10 and your final thoughts on this 80s movie uh, one crazy summer is one shitty movie <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe in 1986 this was better when I was like zero I would have appreciated it more <laughs> but a- as an adult watching this over 20 years later no this this is not working for me uh, the 80s was a weird time, and to be fair, a lot of things we look back from the 80s, we look at and shake our heads. So as I'm saying, maybe in, in 1986, even for adults, this was a lot more of a enjoyable thing. And the comedy style was completely different, because that's not to say I don't like movies that have this ridiculous 80s comedic humor. You know, I look back at movies like Airplane and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. They're all of that very 80s, kitschy style of comedy, but this just did not hit the mark. And it's this I don't know if it's because it was lazy I, I have a feeling, like we said many times, this was something that was just slapped together because they knew they had access to a, a hot actor named John Cusack, and this is what was the result. Oh, and a, a rating. Uh, shit. Uh, well, since one is in the name, let's just give it a one. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, this is a must-go-see when you have time. Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure if we had Gibby on our panel this, week, uh, this month like we did last month, he'd be giving it a nine because he doesn't have taste. I, I would love to get a time machine and go back to when this movie was in theaters and just see what the reaction in theaters to this was. It, I mean, to gross thirteen million at that time. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, to especially me that, for a comedy. Yeah, and it, it probably just like you guys had said, it was because of John Cusack. But I can't see. I, I wouldn't go see it. Well, more you got to consider this is also before the days of things like uh, Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb, where you can mm-hmm. learn about what a movie like is like in theaters. All you know is a trailer. And I think they could probably find enough good jokes in this movie to make a really banging trailer. Mm-hmm. I mean, because personally, I've marked out to the fact of Godzilla makes appearance in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, ladies and gentlemen, was One Crazy Summer. Uh, and from what we've said here at the Four Wheel Movie Club, one shitty movie. <laughs> Uh, for those of you that are listening here live on Mega Powers Radio, we encourage that you call in at 760-512-7247. Join in the call. Talk about what the movies were going on. Uh, the next movie we'll be moving on to is another John Cusack movie, which also has Richard Dreyfus from Jaws. Um, stand by me. So if you're listening to us live here on the uh, Mega Powers Radio, 
Hang tight. We're going to roll in there. You listen to the archive session. Please go to the next video, and we'll be talking about Stand By Me. Rolling on. It's time for Stand By Me, a film that also came out the same day as One Crazy Summer. Uh, August 8th, 1986, with a limited release. It went wide uh, worldwide August 22nd. Um, and it, it's to me, at least, it's a movie that has been endeared by many, and you probably have seen it while you were in school at some point. It's a 1986 American coming-of-age drama comedy directed by Rob Reiner, uh, based on the novella The Body by Stephen King. The title is derived from the Ben E. King song of the same name which plays over the end credits and sporadically through uh, the movie. You'll hear an instrumental version of it. The film tells the story of four boys who go on a hike across the countryside during the summer to find the missing body of a dead kid. We're going to go around the uh, panel of two and just see what was your initial thoughts to this movie, and then we'll dive into it. So we'll start with you, Peyton. What were your initial thoughts on Stand By Me? I cannot believe I went this long without having seen this movie. This is fucking phenomenal uh this is the only movie of this entire group that i think i'm going to keep in my permanent collection this was fantastic uh, especially for child actors to have pulled off what they did the emotions everything they did there was fantastic uh the soundtrack i am a huge fan of 50s and 60s music so i loved the entire soundtrack for this i was a little bummed we didn't actually get to hear stand by me until all the way at the freaking end <laughs> that kind of bothered me but um Excellent tale, excellent coming of age movie. I felt like it was kind of like the Wonder Years, the movie, with mm-hmm. the the voiceovers and just the the way that it was with the kids. But very very enjoyable. It feels good to finally be singing a praise about a movie tonight. This this was great. <laughs> Tony, what was your initial reactions to the movie Stand by Me? I went through a binge watching of movies a couple years back. I uh, stumbled up upon the website Ginny J I N N I where they recommend movies to you based off of the movies that you've already rated. And I watched almost a movie a day. It was something like 280 movies in a year. Wow, you movie file. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It ended up being a a big disappointment for a lot of the movies, but one of the first ones that I watched was Stand By Me, and that actually is one of the reasons why I kept watching the movies, because I was just like, wow, Stand By Me is fucking great. And if... I keep getting recommendations like this. Holy shit, I'm going to have so many more movies that I'm going to need to buy. Stand By Me is so much better than I would have ever thought that it would have been back before I had seen it. I had heard stories about the movie and, you know, recommendations and stuff, and it just didn't seem that interesting to me. A bunch of kids go to find a body? Uh, I don't care. But there's so much positive stuff to talk about in this movie. The acting, the, uh, the, the timing of uh, the movie where everything's set just uh the it's amazing i mean it's not um a movie i would recommend to everybody to watch at any time and that's kind of a something i'll i'll echo later on but it's a damn good movie that i could recommend to anybody and go you will like this movie to play on the fact of uh, stand by me it, like i said it was released in 1986 uh, with a budget of $8 million, and it grossed at the box office $52 million. And that coming-of-age story, uh, like I said, it, it plays a lot in a lot of schools. Uh, there are certain English classes. I remember taking one in high school where they played this. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about this movie, watching it for, I think, the third time now preparing for this podcast, th- there's an all-star cast here that was not an all-star cast at the time. Oh, w- when you look at these people as kids, it's hard to believe you've got yeah. this many future stars. Yeah, if, if you look at the, the cast itself, you have Will Wheaton as Gordy Lachance, who's the lead character, River Phoenix as Chris Chambers, who's his best friend, Corey Feldman, another friend, uh, Teddy Duchamp, Jerry O'Connell, who is definitely unrecognizable in this movie as Vern. <laughs> well, uh, badass. Yeah. <laughs> and he even makes, all right, let's make fun of the fat kid. All right. right. <laughs> sincerely. Uh, yeah, sincerely, guys. Um, I haven't found my pennies yet. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland as the bully ace. Uh, John Cusack as the cameo appearance here and there as uh, Denny Lachance, uh, Gordy's older brother. And Richard Dreyfus as Gordy, uh, an adult Gordy. So, Oh, oh and, and let's not forget the the it man of the time, John Cusack. Yeah, as Denny, the the, the brother of uh, Gordy. It, 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 this this casting list is just 
phenomenal looking back at it. At the time, they're, everybody's probably like, who, who the hell are these kids? Like, these, what are these? Corey Feldman? He's one of the Lost Boys? Okay. I don't even know if Lost Boys was out at this time. Um, I'm actually trying to look at these guys' filmographies to see. It doesn't look like any of them so far have done anything before this. I didn't get to Corey Feldman yet. Uh, no, Corey Feldman's done a lot. He did, like, Gremlins and Friday yeah. the 13th, Fox and the Hound, Goonies. Yeah. Uh, not Lost Boys yet. Lost Boys was actually next. He did Goonies, Stand By Me, and then Lost Boys in a row. Jesus. What kind of kid has a career like that? <laughs> the one that vanishes when he becomes an adult. <laughs> Uh, Corey Feldman probably being the, like the highest billing next to Richard Dreyfuss when it comes to this movie. Um, the the cast itself. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Uh, Tony, how did you feel about the casting? Do you feel the kids meshed well? Was it believable? And would you change anything it being a late 80s movie? That's one of the strongest points in this movie, the casting. They are not only such good actors, but damn, they pull off being friends. Uh one thing that I can really speak to, uh, speak volumes to, how they pull off is you get the feeling that these four friends have been friends since they were little, uh, little, little kids. They're supposed to be about 12 years old in this uh, movie. Mm-hmm. And um, just watching the interactions that they have between each other where they're, you know, they've got these inside jokes, they're picking on each other, but at the same time, there's at least one scene for almost everybody where people express that they care about each other. Uh, it makes me think about the friendships that I've had from that age and from beyond that and afterward and everything. Um, the reactions between uh, Chris and Gordy. Uh, you've got these kids, and they're playing scenes that adults could fuck up, and they're pulling it off so much better than what I've seen in movies with you know, 60, 70-year-old people that have gone through entire lives and they have all this experience these teenagers or whatever they were at the time, 10 year olds or something have so much weight to them that especially Vern (laughs) that you believe everything that's happening. I completely believe that Gordy is this insecure kid. I completely believe that Chris is this troubled kid that uh, wants to do better. And then you've got the other people like um, Kiefer Sutherland who, so a lot of people might not really be, that familiar with him outside of like the 24 series or whatever, but he's playing a hero in those kind of things. And in this movie, he is a despicable person. And you believe that when he pulls his knife out, he could be stabbing one of these kids, the oblivious adults, completely oblivious. They are the quintessential, um, projections of what these kids see them as. They're just there to serve purposes they're assholes, like the uh, the junkyard guy. I mean, the, the casting in this is perfect for it. Every character feels like the actual character. Payne, what were your thoughts on the casting for Stand By Me? I actually had no pre-existing knowledge of who these kids were when I watched this movie. I didn't know much at all. Like, you know, I, I've seen the name around, and of course I knew the song, so the name resonated with me as soon as I saw it, but... When I went through it, while I'm watching it, I just kept thinking to myself, holy crap, these kids are freaking amazing actors. And it's funny, I was just talking about dealing with child actors on a set on my Game of Thrones podcast, Santa Snow, also available on fanboysanonymous.com. We were talking about how they went to this part where there's supposed to be what's called the children of the forest. And my friend who had read the books was upset because in the books there's like 100 kids, but in the TV show they only showed one kid. And I was just thinking in my head, man, trying to have like 100 12-year-old kids on set, that would just be such a disaster. It's one thing to have one. You could usually keep one kid under control. But once you get more than two, it's really hard to keep them from going rambunctious or getting ADD ridden or what it is. They had these four kids, and this movie was based on these four kids. There's very little of anybody else. This movie is these four kids, and they carried it so goddamn well. And I think Tony hit the nail perfectly in the head when he said they were doing things that adults can't even do. I mean, they're sitting there, they're smoking cigarettes, they're talking about big life things, what they're going to be doing with their lives. And yeah, they're talking about stupid kid stuff too. Like, if you can only eat one food for the rest of life, what do you eat? Pez. Like, yeah. they, they bounce back and forth so well. They represent being kids and kids becoming adults and being friends. Tony said that too. I, I not only believe that these guys were friends forever. I felt like part of the gang as well with how intimate that the scenes were between them when they're like wrestling with each other or helping each other in a tough situation like picking leeches off of each other or standing up to the bully. 
fantastic choice for who they got in this. It, it almost is like lightning in a bottle. Like, you'll never be able to get a childhood cast like this again. Uh, so, super props to that. When, when the credits rolled at the end of the movie and I saw who all these people were, I was blown away. I was like, holy shit, I know that name. Holy shit, I know that name too. <laughs> holy fuck! <laughs> like, like, got better and better each one. Uh, the only person I recognized in the whole movie, of course, was John Cusack. And I got to say, I enjoyed his role in this movie much more than I did in One Crazy Summer. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw him for about the same time period. <laughs> um, to build more onto the casting, and, and I think this attributes to a lot of how, how good these actor, child actors were and why a lot, of, the, most of them went on to have great careers afterwards, um, is the characters they played. If you look into the child, the children that were in this group of four that do this journey, they all have their specific reasons and relatively deep backstories for each of them. Uh, you know, Gordy Lachance having the older brother who passed away and feels worthless to his parents. Chris Chambers, a kid that ultimately wants to do right but gets tied up into the wrong stuff. Teddy DeChamp, who has a father who returned home from war uh, i'm assuming the world war ii who's got post-traumatic war syndrome i i I forget what the the official name of it is um and he himself is crazy and then Vern, who is the typical fat kid but at the same time just wants to fit in and is kind of nervous timid and always that guy that voice of reason kind of when the other three are like let's go do it who cares i think the the backstory they put into these uh four kids with the limited time they had, ultimately improved the story. When it comes to the character building, we talked about the casting, the, the kids nailed it. Character building wise, Tony, what were your thoughts on that? I really loved, like you had said, the, the backstories behind these people. Because when you're a kid, you don't really pay attention to a lot of that stuff. And if you do, you kind of put it in the back of your mind. I remember, you know, growing up and we're around that age, and I'm starting to pay attention to the fact that certain kids are being ignored by their parents and I'm not, or they act a certain way because that's how their family is. And you're right around that age where that stuff starts really kind of playing into like, is that kid a bad kid or is that bad, a bad kid that way because of the way he was brought up and seeing somebody like a Chris Chambers, you look at uh, his backstory and all you need to know is this is a bad kid who's only bad out of necessity. And he's actually not, you know, a, a bane on society or anything like that. He was pushed in the wrong direction. And then you look at, um, I can't remember his name. What was it? Duchamp? Mm-hmm. It, he is a product of abuse. So, of course, he's going to have this kind of Stockholm syndrome with his dad. He hates his dad. He's constantly talking about, like, you know, his dad's burning off his ear and everything like that, yet the minute somebody insults him, it's an insult to him as well. And he has to declare, you know, my dad's torn the beaches of Normandy and all this. That stuff happens all the time with people. And you see your, your Gordies who are ignored by their family, so that's why he has this mentality that I'm no good, it doesn't matter, I'm just a stupid writer, that kind of a thing. Um Every character just hits the nail on the head like that. It's amazing that they were able able to pull that off in such a short time frame. And a couple of them only get, you know, a minute or so here and there to explain their backstories. But it ends up being all that you need to be able to buy into everything that happens in the movie. Uh, Peyton, what what were your thoughts on the character building? Not only do they develop these great characters in a typical storytelling sense, but they develop them in a way that you felt they you were seeing these characters from a child's point of view. Um, and that goes as a credit to the camera angles they were using, but the the way that he felt like his parents were talking to him and that his brother, when I'm talking about him, I mean Gordy Lachance, the main one, um, the way that he was interacting with his brother and that was the only person who was giving him any looks and the way that they always took it low, once again, uh, I remember the scene when he's in the store and the butcher or whoever you would consider him, the attendant, is cutting meat for him and he's just talking about how great his brother was and and he's just sitting there and you come to these low angles and you see how down he feels just because even even when he's miles and miles away from home the only people that seem to care about is his brother um the only one i felt that was kind of weak was duchamp i i don't know i i didn't fully buy what was up with him 
I have a feeling this whole thing about his dad storming the beach in Normandy, I was hoping that that was going to come out to be, like, not true. Like, maybe his dad is just, like, a complete fucking worthless sack of shit, and they were just telling him that so he would feel better about his father. Um, I, I really don't feel like there was a full conclusion on that one. And for that matter, I feel like there wasn't a full conclusion on some other things, like uh, the conflict between Chambers and his brother's gang. Like, they're just like, this isn't over. We don't forget and all this other shit, and then, like, they just come back to the town, and the movie's over. And that kind of harkens back to what Tony was saying about movies just ending because something happened, rather than the whole thing being concluded. What Even when they're talking about the epilogue of what happened to all these characters, they never mentioned the, the Cobras, or whatever the heck their gang name was. Mm-hmm. Which, those guys were well uh, well casted as well. I enjoyed all of them. Uh, one side story that happened to come up throughout this, and I think it's one of the lighter moments of the movie. Uh, the boys are sitting around a campfire, and they keep prodding Gordy to tell a story. <laughs> and I, I personally love this scene, and I'm, I really want to talk about it, is Lardass. <laughs> the legend of Lardass. The legend of Lardass, and how everybody in that entire tent threw up blueberries, even though only four people were eating blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> We'll go around the panel. We'll start with you, Peyton. What were your thoughts on The Legend of Lardass? Well, when it started, I had a feeling this was going to be another one of those scenes, kind of like the alien doing the Minnesota frog dance, like, hello, my baby, hello, <laughs> my darling, just something that was pointless and dragged out and stupid. And it actually took a while to pick up. You know, there was there was a good, like, three minutes, I think, where I'm just like, okay, this this is going on too long. Where the hell is this going? And by the end, though, it, it, it won me. Um, I, I don't really understand how drinking castor oil in an egg makes you throw up like that, but sure, okay. I, I, I'll i believe it for this. Um, <laughs> the most ridiculous thing is, is, just as you pointed out, the four people on the stage throw up blueberries, and then the mayor, who was like <laughs> the master of ceremonies, throws up. And I think he says, like, he throws it up on his wife's tits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the twins threw up on each other. <laughs> it's, it's just hilarious. Uh, Tony, what were your thoughts on the uh, Legend of Lardass? Speaking of with the the Duchamp thing and trying to um, project ahead of time whether or not it was going to be true or false what happened, when I first watched this, I was thinking to myself, okay, this is going to be some kind of thing where you hit a real um, emotional core and Gordy's trying to tell a story of like the ignored kid turns out to win. And then it turns into just he's a kid, so he's still going to turn it into, and he threw up all over the place. It isn't that great. And it's a good twist there that uh, it's not just another emotional segment. It's something that shows he's still a 12-year-old kid. So he might have this talent for writing, and he might um, you know, be this existential kind of character like all the other ones where every once in a while they're, they're going to sit down and uh, debate about life, but he's still a kid, so his idea of telling a good story around a campfire is going to be you know, the, the fat guy who barfed all over everybody and then they barfed all over each other, and then it's the whole tent of barfing up blueberries and uh, it wouldn't have the same effect if it didn't have such a big build up, and it's such a great moment to just sort of sit back, relax, have a little bit of fun with the, the kids before you get into the next big crisis that's happening. I think that The Legend of Lardass is amazing. <laughs> um, just one final note on The Legend of Lardass. Uh, after <laughs> Gordy gets done uh, telling the story to the other guys, uh, Teddy immediately goes, well, then what happens? To me, I thought that was a nice hat tip to the people who just aren't happy with what's good enough and keep pushing. And then Gordy goes, uh, I don't know, because he just went home or something. And <laughs> Teddy just responds, well, that ending sucks. <laughs> How did you guys feel about that little interaction after such an awesome blueberry hurling contest? Uh, Tony, sorry. Uh, um, you know, let's also go about that. You mentioned how he's one of the people that is not satisfied with enough of that. It's funny how he goes, well, the better ending would have been he turns into uh, somebody who's in the military and he kills people and whatever. Um, a lot of kids do that. They are built a certain way and – for somebody like myself who's really into action movies and superheroes and all that, uh, I sometimes do that with other movies where it's like, well, I, I want it to, to keep going and all that. And, you know, we even brought it up earlier. We want to know what happens with the Cobras and stuff. Well, that ending, why, why can't you add more and why can't this happen and all that? But 
I thought it it was a re- uh, really interesting thing that they have Teddy just snap back into that role of uh, supporting what his dad represents to him because you can take a character like Lardass and he's the the person getting shit upon and he fights back and he wins it, whatever, but that's not good enough. For somebody like Teddy who needs to stand up for himself against even his own dad, you have to take it to the, the violent level after that because he's got so much pent-up rage that it's not good enough that Lardass makes everybody throw up on each other. He should kill them. And you're you're kind of worried at that point, like, is Teddy going to grow up to be a mass murderer? Is he going to be that guy who kills somebody uh, because they get into an argument sometime? Because so throughout the movie, several different points in it, he's got a short fuse. And he's the one punching Vern for no reason. He's the one that is arguing with the junkyard uh, guy. He's, you know, this uh, this violent character, so... Vern's an idiot. That's a swell story, <laughs> sincerely. Uh, Chris is the one who's the supportive one. That's great. You know, keep telling the story. That's awesome. You've got a talent. Gordy is satisfied enough with the story. Teddy's the one who has to take it to a violent level after that. I think that that's perfect for the reactions for the people. Uh, Peyton, your thoughts on that? Every, uh, the interaction after the story was told? I don't have anything near as deep as Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is kind of ironic that we have I literally was just talking a minute ago about how dissatisfied I was with not having a conclusion to the Cobras and even we were talking earlier about the dissatisfaction with the Jaws ending and then it comes up like that that's that's kind of ironic that that all comes together like that but uh, why did he kill Hooper? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually didn't even think there was anything wrong with the ending I, I was actually a little taken by surprise when they said that I was like oh that's that's the end of the story the the everybody threw up on each other. Like, what more do you need to say? And then they went to the bathroom and washed up. Like, the story ends. <laughs> uh, one other interesting thing about the uh, movie Stand By Me, it was originally called The Body, which is the book it was based off of Stephen King. What is a and novella? It, I, I don't know. I guess it's novel. Is it like the, the female version of a novel? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, like, Stephen King only calls his shit that, just so he sounds fancy. Mm. Um, I think it's supposed to be something that's a shorter one. It's not um, quite a full-length novel. It's oh, maybe I could read it then. More of a um, <laughs> collection of short stories or something like that. I don't know if they're you know people throw terms around all crazy, so who knows? <laughs> um, but it, it was based off of uh, Stephen King's book, The Body. Um, who Stephen King would later come out and say this was the best adaptation of uh, book to film of his. <laughs> um, would you agree with that statement? I mean, I've seen several. Stephen King movies. It, it, to me, it shocks me a little bit that this was a Stephen King uh, novel into a uh, or novella. Sorry, into a movie because to me, Pet Cemetery was a, the best I've ever seen. Um, we'll start with you on this one, Peyton. Do you feel that uh, Stephen King was unjust in saying that this was the best transition that he's ever had, book to film? Uh, that's that's tough. I mean, you gotta, you definitely got to say that. It's a lot better when Stephen King himself does not direct the movies, because <laughs> when he does, they're usually pretty freaking bad. I'm looking at you, Langoliers. Oh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that, that's really tough to say, um, when, especially when you've got movies like Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile. Uh, there's so many good Stephen King films. This one's definitely up there, and Rob Reiner is a phenomenal director, and maybe that's why. Maybe he just liked working with Rob Reiner so much, that's what made it amazing. I would have to say Shawshank is number one, though. Though this is a very big contender, and I think maybe the longer this bakes on me, maybe it'll be my favorite. Um, I think maybe he might say that is if this is a shorter novel, the fact that they were able to take what was a smaller story and extend it into something that felt so big and awesome. Because Shawshank, I have to believe, even in novel form, felt the exact same way it was in the movie. This, I think, is something where they blew it up to something so much better than what it was. Tony, your thoughts on this being uh, Stephen King's favorite and best adaptation for book two film? I've never read any Stephen King stories or books, so I've never been able to compare the movies. But um, Shawshank Redemption is the movie I consider the best movie of all time. And from what I've been told and from what I've read on like Wikipedia and everything like that, it seems like that was a short story that they blew up as well. Oh. So if that's the case, then... It'd be tough to argue against Shawshank doing that, but 
I know another thing that he said he was really into was The Mist. Oh, uh, that movie I didn't think was that impressive, but it was. No, that movie sucked. <laughs> yeah, it, it was an interesting concept. So I don't know what's going on in the book in that, but uh, he said that that was you know a much better take as well. So the three movies um, outside of Stand by Me that I've seen that I thought were at least interesting concepts, and I'd want to know what's going on in the book instead were The Mist, uh, Shawshank, and The Green Mile. So. I don't know. I mean, uh, everybody's going to have their own personal preferences, and being the writer of the stories, you've got a, a different responsibility that you have to take with. If anybody does an adaptation, they're going to change some things around, and it's good that Stephen King has a, a positive outlook on these kind of things, because you look at somebody like an Alan Moore, he's a complete asshole when it comes to that. He refuses to have anything to do with any of these movies. The Watchmen, oh, terrible garbage. I don't want to have my name on this. And V for Vendetta, they ruined everything about it. And I'm sure if they did a, a shot-by-shot remake of The Killing Joke, he'd call it garbage. So it's nice that Stephen King is able to give credit to those people for building on top of it. And Stand By Me, even if it wasn't his story, I would have to assume that he would like the movie. Um, real quick, before we go through, uh, we touched base on it a little bit at the beginning of it. The soundtrack and the music for the film seeing as it was uh based in the 1950s this is all 1950s classic rock songs songs such as um you know lollipop great balls of fire yakety yak and of course at the end uh stand by me even though they tease you through most of the film how did you guys feel that it, given the era that the movie was supposed to be filmed in um how did the music flow uh tony we'll start with you on this one i tend to hate that stuff. I'm not a big fan of 50s culture. I think doo-wop and, um, you know, the, a lot of the songs that are in the movie and stuff are annoying as hell to listen to. But in this movie, not annoying whatsoever, which is so rare. Lollipop is not a song I like. In the movie, it works so perfectly that I can't uh, have wanted them to change it. Stand By Me, I really like that song, so that's a difference. But, um... 50s culture in general is just something I don't like, but watching this movie, it didn't bother me the slightest bit. Whether you're somebody who's w- driving an old car, and I'm sure there's some people that watch this movie and they like that because they like that culture. And to them, you know, oh, you, you go back into a time where I remember it, where you can go to the store and pay a dollar fifty and get uh, enough meals for four people to eat, or uh, you know, Vern's got the the stupid comb because it's like well, we got to take pictures and I'm gonna t- part my hair back like in the 50s and whatever. Um, that culture is annoying to me, and in this movie, it does not hurt it whatsoever. If anything, it just proves how well they did this movie from how uh, much it wasn't annoying. Peyton, your thoughts on the soundtrack? Fucking phenomenal. I'm the opposite of Tony. I love 50s culture. I grew up listening to my mother's old 45s, so pretty much every single song on the soundtrack was something I grew up with. Stand By Me is, hands down, my favorite song of the modern era of music. And I mean, like, when you don't count things from, like, before the 1900s. Say, like, 1930s on. Stand By Me is my favorite written song. Every variation of it I've pretty much ever heard, I've absolutely adored. Um, and, and a lot of these other songs too, Lollipop is not one of them. I like, I'll agree that one is annoying as hell, but then <laughs> you got like, favorite. you got like s- just all these great representations of music at the time with Jerry Lee Lewis, Buddy Holly, the Dell Vikings, uh, that come go with me song is one of my favorite songs from the fifties era as well. So I was happy to hear that one in there. Uh, Yakety Yak, a very fun tune. I thought they did a great, great job picking the soundtrack and really getting you immersed into what was supposed to be the setting of the movie. Uh, because, a lot of the times when they do these blasts of the past, um, I, I, you know, around this time, or maybe, no, it was maybe about, uh, started about, they're still making it this time, I think, but about 10 years before is when they were doing Happy Days, and they were also trying to hit that 50s culture, and they just missed the mark so much. It, it just came across as a cheesy parody. This came across genuine and really likable. What was that song that they were singing? Um, it sounded like it would have been the theme to a TV show or something. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, uh, the uh, the night song, right? It's like the heart of a man or something like that. Like they're they're singing it when they're walking around the bridge, and then they call back to it a little bit later. 
Yeah, because Vern ends up getting, like, it looks like he has egg on his face when he sings it by himself after, like, an emotional moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That that actually was freaking catchy. Like, I found myself humming it through the hallways of my house as I just got done watching it. I'm like, this song's <laughs> not even that good. <laughs> right. But it's something that would have caught on for a kid, that they would just be all sitting there singing that song and, you know... Burn will try it up again later on, and nobody wants to do it because it's like, hey, fuck you, fat ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go into the final thoughts and our ranking one to ten, um, I can give you some award nominations that were given to this movie. The best director for Rob Reiner in 1986 Directors Guild of America. He also was nominated for the uh, 86 Hollywood Foreign Press Association. The picture was nominated for uh, dra- best drama in 86 Foreign Press Association. And the screenplay itself was also uh, nominated in the Independent Spirit Awards. Going through that and it just all this awesomeness that is Stand By Me and probably by far the the best movie of um, the Four Real Movie Club we've done tonight. And I, I, we may even go into saying so far. Um, Peyton, we'll start with you. What are your final thoughts on Stand By Me and what would you rank it on 1 to 10? <sighs> I, as I said, I, I had not seen this movie before, and I am so glad that I participated in this month's Four Real Movie Club, so I got to watch it. Um, it. It was a lot of give and take, because I had to watch One Crazy Summer, too. <laughs> um, and even rewatching Jaws again was a little bit of a struggle, and uh, I, this this was such a treat. I, I am so happy to have seen this. As I said, this will probably remain in my collection for for years and years to come i don't know when the next time i'll watch it again but i definitely will be uh so happy that all these kids went on to big things that all these kids became well-known actors and are are probably making very good money for themselves because they knocked it out of the park as as kids and to do that is such such a unique thing um i love the cultures in the movie i love the cinematography in it I, i love the the conflict that every single character had both as friends and both with their enemies of the the cobras so if i had to rank this on a a one to ten i almost want to give it a ten but there are some loose ends like i said like the inconclusion to that one storyline with the cobras um and i even would have liked to have seen more with duchamp and it it just also wasn't a technically perfect movie because it was shot in the 80s and we've learned a lot about filmmaking since then so i have to give this i would give this a a nine almost a nine and a half even but i'm I'm just going to go with a nine sweet tony your final thoughts and the scale one to ten this is a movie that um i'm so glad held up the second time that i was watching it because so often you watch a movie it'll be okay or it'll be good you watch it a second time, and you'll start seeing a bunch of flaws that you didn't come across the first time around. This one, um, if anything, it just reiterated to me that I'm going to have to rewatch this throughout different times in my life just to see if my perspective uh, viewpoint of it has changed. Because I, when, when that happened, and I originally saw that, that was maybe three years ago. And three years doesn't seem like a huge time, but three years can change your outlook. And uh, now that... I went through whatever I've gone through over the past couple of years. That's changed my perception of the movie. So I'm going to have to rewatch this, you know, every five years or so to see what changes throughout that. And it bangs on all cylinders, um, which makes it so easy to be able to do that. You've got your humor throughout the movie. Like, of course, it's the fat kid that drops his burger, you know. And then you've got your emotionally killing moments like how Chris, the hero of the freaking movie, does not get a happy ending. And it just tells you that life just this is life. It doesn't matter if it's the best uh, ending that can possibly happen. The stories don't work out that way. Um, I'd have to go with a 9 again uh, just the same as Peyton did. Of course it's not an absolutely perfect movie but nothing's perfect. So I think that uh, this is about as good as you could possibly get. 9 out of 10, sincerely. Awesome. For those of you sticking around, we'll be going into our next film here on the Four Real Movie Club, Weekend at Bernie's, one of my personal favorite comedies. For those of you that are listening on the archive sessions of fanboysanonymous.com, make sure you click into the next video below and listen to Weekend at Bernie's. 
As we roll on, it's time for Weekend at Bernie's, the 1989 dark comedy film directed by Ted Kocheff and starring Andrew McCarthy and Jonathan Silverman. As young insurance corporation employees discover their boss, Bernie, is deceased. Discovering that Bernie ordered their deaths to cover up his embezzlement with orders to not kill them if he is around, they attempt to convince people that Bernie is still alive. The film was released three times on DVD, once from Artisan Entertainment in 1998 and twice by MGM in 2005 and 2011. MGM released the film for the first time on Blu-ray May 6, 2014. I have to pick that up. Anyway. (laughs) Note to self. Yes, note to put a little post-it right there. That came out a month ago. What am I waiting for? I tell you, man, some of those beach girls would look great in Blu-ray. Oh, God, yes. Hopefully the the voiceover work will sync with their mouths in the Blu-ray edition. (laughs) Uh, Going around our panel here. Tony, we'll start with you. What were your thoughts on Weekend at Bernie? I've seen Weekend at Bernie's 2 many, many times. That was a movie that's been on Comedy Central all the time. So uh, when I saw Weekend at Bernie's 1 this time, uh, I haven't seen since God knows when, and I really didn't remember anything about the movie. And I'm disappointed. I actually kind of like Weekend at Bernie's 2 better. It's a really unpopular opinion, but... Uh, I think that it, it takes too long to get started, and when the Bernie death stuff and the jokes happen, then it's got some uh, some humor to it that I can get behind, but that takes like 45 minutes to get into, and that struggle until you get to that point, it's a little bit too much for me to handle. Peyton, what were your initial thoughts on Weekend at Bernie's? Well, Weekend at Bernie's was another movie that I had just put off seeing for a long time. And this one, I had definitely seen the name all over the place. I knew it was one of those typical early Comedy Central era movies. And I don't know, I I just stood away from it for some reason. Maybe the name just (laughs) turned me off. I don't know what it was. Just something about it, I had no interest. Um, Now that I actually watched it, I see that this is where the... Well, I I can't say this is where it started because I know they've done things before. But this is the modern era version of the trope of the dead body started and you've seen this parody dozens and dozens of times since then uh simpsons has done it of course um pretty much any television show i'm sure has done something similar to this at some point i don't like it i think it's so overplayed i think it's something you can do for like one scene but a whole movie how many jokes can you really base on this one shtick it it gets old really really fast a whole Um, movie plus another and 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 to be (laughs) honest it it took so long to get to that point. There there was so much time spent on build up that did not need to. These these characters really did not need to be fleshed out. This situation did not need to be that fleshed out. You you could have had that whole deal where they're finding the numbers and get themselves on a boat going there to the island in like five minutes. There's no reason that had to be drawn out for an hour. It it, it was really really rough. When they finally got things going, some of the shtick with the dead body was great. Um, it wasn't all bad. You know, there, there's points in this movie I did like, but for the most part, I think this movie is a bit overrated. <laughs> um, give you a quick rundown of the movie itself. It was released July 5th, 1989, uh, with a runtime of 97 minutes, with a budget of $15 million and a box office of $30 million. Um, so despite its successful grossing at the box office and doubling its profits, considering what the budget was. The film uh, has not been a critical success, holding only 50% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, though it is still a cultural icon due to its financial success. Uh, Like we talk on most movies here, we're going to tap into the casting itself. Um, To me, all the the people in this movie are relatively unknown. Um, Tony, what were your feelings on the casting, and was it right? Was it too much? Was it too little? I think the two primary characters played by uh, Silverman and McCarthy, both of them come off like they could be movie stars back in that era. Gwen, she's a waste. She's uh, some hot girl that they threw into the movie. She knew somebody. She blew somebody. I don't know how she got into the movie. <laughs> um, but she's just typical. Uh, she's actually had the biggest career out of anybody in this movie, by the way. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, I'm surprised. <laughs> Because <laughs> she just seemed to me like the the horror movie kind of thing where you cast a model because no, kind of dude, a banger. She, and that's she's it. still active in, this, in the industry, dude. She's doing pretty good for herself. That's odd. Uh, <laughs> star of the movie, though, is Bernie. And uh, kudos to that guy for being able to pull that off because I know that that's got to be difficult as hell to be 
completely stone faced when all this stuff is happening, and even little things like uh, making sure everything's limp on him, but making sure you hit your spots and you're in the right placement for everything. That's got to be really difficult to do. So he was uh, the best possible person they could have gotten for that. Everybody else he could have really replaced. Maybe not McCarthy. Maybe he brought a little bit of charm extra to it, but. Um, Casting, I thought, you know, perfectly fine overall for this kind of a movie. Peyton, your thoughts? Uh, they, were, they were fine. I mean, for, for what they needed him to be, this was a low-budget 80s film. As Tony said, these guys who played the main two characters definitely came off as people who would have been John Cusack at the time if they had just gotten the right agent or whatever. Um, but looking at their careers, I don't see anything too big coming out of them otherwise. Uh, I thought the chick was really, really cute. I mean, she wasn't a phenomenal actor or anything, but I loved her face. She had that 80s cute look going on. Um, mm-hmm. But definitely, I think the, the person who deserves the most praise is the guy who played Bernie. To to be so so cold and so limp throughout all those times, uh, being carried and, you know, not laying on the couch is easy, but when you have two guys with their hands under your crotch and shit, like, <laughs> sort of trying to stay perfectly still and look like you're dead is definitely not an easy task. Um I would actually be interested in seeing some kind of behind the scenes to see what points in the movie was actually him and which ones were a dummy. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously scenes where like he's being dragged behind the boat and hitting buoys. That's a dummy. And you can even tell with the way the body's flapping around. <laughs> now but, there was a lot of them where I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. It was just really good. Um, I, I actually think the, uh, the biggest hits in this movie were the extras. Like a lot of the people that are just saying hi to Bernie as they're going by, I thought were kind of funny. Um, all the girls were smoking. Oh, smoking girls just everywhere you looked. Like, even when they're just walking by in the dock, it's just all these beautiful women. Holy cow. Um, and I think one of, who actually was one of my favorites was the, the, the Goomba that gets sent to kill him, mm-hmm. who has to keep coming back over and over again. I thought he was really funny. Oh, and the, the Asian gardener. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, like, all the small parts are the ones I like better than anybody else. Um... When it comes to this movie, uh, Tony touched base on it, and he said it was kind of an unpopular opinion. But to me, it, the second sequel, or the, the sequel to this movie, was phenomenal. I, I am a huge fan of this franchise. I'm not going to lie. Um, did you feel it justified a sequel? Uh, and, and let's just like take off initial reactions that we were in. Let's just think we're in 1989 when this was first released, and then you hear three weeks later, like uh, kind of like how we hear like Guardians of the Galaxy got greenlit for a sequel before it even came out what would be your reaction and uh, we'll start with you tony if you just saw this in the theater and somebody goes well weekend at bernie's two's coming <laughs> how would you react to that kind of news let's just imagine before weekend at bernie's came out that somebody shows you a commercial for it and it's like here's a comedy about these guys with a dead guy and all that you'd have to be like what the fuck <laughs> like <laughs> the fuck is this movie and then to to watch that and then go, oh, we're going to get a sequel of that, you you probably had such a negative reaction. I mean, it would sort of be the equivalent of if somebody would have said uh, they were going to get a sequel to Dude, Where's My Car? or something. <laughs> but We Got a Birdies 2 ended up being so much more entertaining in my mind. Um, and something that makes me laugh about that is the sequel is so ridiculous. I mean, it, it's standard... Um, you get these production companies and they're like, okay, well, how do we take it to the next level? Let's have, I don't know, the Bahamas or Hawaii or wherever they are and voodoo and Bernie can walk in this one and stuff. It's the the type of insanity that you hear about what almost happens with other movies. Like, um, uh, tying back, uh, I mentioned Kevin Smith earlier with mall rats. Kevin Smith was apparently approached before that they wanted to do a sequel to Beetlejuice and it was Beetlejuice goes Hawaiian (laughs) <laughs> so is it the same people that did this like where they just like anything you make a sequel out of let's just put it in like fucking the tropics and like beetlejuice can do this kind of crazy shit too and well we can do a crossover beetlejuice goes and meets dead bernie and uh but that sequel probably when they announced it at the time it was probably just like what the fuck this movie shouldn't have existed in the beginning and we're getting a sequel but it ended up being so damn entertaining so uh, Peyton, what would your reaction be if you had just walked out of some, from seeing this and then opened your phone to see on, like, fanboysnotice.com that they're going to make a Weekend at Bernie's 2? Well, 
that that kind of thing just didn't happen back then. First off, we didn't have fanboysanonymous.com or any similar <laughs> website like that. And also, they didn't really make sequels, first off, right away, or even at all very often. It took a lot for a movie to get a sequel. Like, it had to have done really well, or there had to have been a pre-existing plan for the story to have had a sequel, like with, a, with Star Wars. You know, Star Wars, of course, planned to be a trilogy, but that all depended if the first movie made enough money, which, thank God, it did. Mm-hmm. This movie, I mean, it made its money back twofold, but that's not a lot. That that's really not a lot, I think, to warrant a sequel. So I, I was, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that this movie went and got a sequel. I haven't seen it, so I, I can't speak about comparing it. Um, I, I can't imagine it's, it's much better. I mean, once again, the shtick gets old in one movie. How much, how could you drag it out for a whole another one? Um, but maybe they had better writers. Maybe I, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak because I haven't seen it. Um, to play off the whole sequel thing. Considering this movie is almost 30 years old, which is kind of scary, um, <laughs> and considering we're all going to be almost 30 years old. Yeah, well, the, the movie's younger than us. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's too crazy about that. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I could kill um, myself. <laughs> in this day and age, especially with certain other movies from that time frame being remade, do you think a remake of Weekend at Bernie's, if Ugh. written better, is possible? Payton, uh, we'll start with you. No freaking way. Like I said, this trope is so overdone. You see it parried in so many other things. I don't think someone could take another movie seriously if they tried to make another one. And if they did, just do something else. Don't do Weekend at Bernie's. Do do another story where you have a dead guy. Uh, Tony, your thoughts? Yeah, I think you couldn't pull it off now. And that's um, mostly because, like Payton said, it's become a trope. So... It wouldn't necessarily be you trying to redo a movie. It would be, we've seen this before a bunch of times with everything else. It's kind of like if you wanted to do a remake of Jaws, people wouldn't be thinking of it as much as you're trying to remake Jaws as you're trying to do a Jaws, mm-hmm. which is, uh, it, it's kind of hard to explain it like that. But um, Which is why you need to put the shark in a tornado. Right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you need to put Bernie in a tornado. <laughs> That's how he dies. He can just flop around, you know. But it'll be the real actor. It won't be his uh, stunt double. Um, yeah, I don't think you could ever pull off doing a sequel like that because I think that part of the charm of what ended up making this movie happen and the sequel happen and the reason that people still mention it nowadays is because it's already past that threshold of it was in the 80s and it was ridiculous. And a lot of people now that would be liking Weekend at Bernie's were young enough that they could get past that. I don't think... Uh, you'd be able to do that now. I think there's too much cynicism going around and people have already seen this kind of stuff a million times and everything's so much more serious too. I mean, people loved movies that were silly back around that time because you could get away with it. Now, you see things that are uh, even like pretty serious things and if it's not dark and gritty and whatever, people don't like it. So you do a dark and gritty weekend of Bernie's, it's going to flop. You try to do a silly one, it's going to flop. Okay, so what we'll do is um, go around real quick. Like I said, this is only a 97-minute movie, uh, and it's pretty straightforward, as in they're carrying a dead guy around so they don't get shot. Um, final thoughts in a scale 1 to 10. We'll start with you, Tony. This is so 80s that you kind of have to love at least part of it for that. The clothes, the whole like radical party with the mullets <laughs> and everything. Like, um, It's a shame, though, that it seems like they pad it out because they have a lack of material. And maybe if you could take all the good parts from Weekend of Bernie's 1 and Weekend of Bernie's 2 and make them one movie, it would be hilarious. But separately, it doesn't do as well. The last half of the movie is much more entertaining than the first half. And um, I'd probably give it about a five. Okay. And Mr. Payton. I really do not understand how this movie has become as infamous, well, I shouldn't say, but as, as well known as it has. Like, as when people are talking about famous comedy movies throughout the years, they're like, oh, Weekend at Bernie's. That's definitely one that should be in, the, in that list. I don't get it. Um, I, the only possible reason I could see for that is the whole concept of trying to keep the dead body alive in front of people is a fun thing to parody and you can do it in a, do it in a lot of cases but for this movie I, I just don't think the execution was very well um, the the jokes got old fast they didn't get creative enough with them um, and they really tried they really tried to be creative but it just came off dumb um, the, the most of the better comedy was actually between the two friends and it actually was between the dead body 
the best part of the movie was the killer who had to keep coming back. I, I like that, how he didn't think he got the job done. He just get, kept getting more and more ridiculous. As a matter of fact, my absolute favorite part is when he's coming back for the second time and the one guy dumps Bernie's body over the side and it falls on top of him. And he thinks Bernie's attacking him. He's like, oh, oh, you want to come at me, huh? And he, like, presses <laughs> him down and chokes him. I thought that was really funny. Um, so... For the movie itself, I think I will also go middle of the ground. I'll, I'll give it a five, and I think that is being a little bit generous. But because it's gained the popularity I, and all the times it's been joked on, I have to give it a little bit more praise for that. Uh, but for the girls in the movie, I'm going to give them a ten. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, ladies and gentlemen, have, has been our four real movie club. Weekend of Bernie's being one of my favorites, but also covering Jaws, Stand By Me, and One Crazy Summer. Uh, go back and check out all our other episodes of the four-wheel movie club the mel brooks films are what we kicked off first and then we went into monster films uh and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go to tony and mike to see what they've got going on in their world so start with you tony what's going on all right guys well pay attention to fanboysanonymous.com we have so many things coming your way i mean i could list things for an hour of different articles we've got going on different podcasts coming up in the future and everything but uh, one thing to really stand out and uh, for me to mention is coming up later this week, we're going to be at the Too Many Games convention in the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. So if you're in the area, come by, say hello to us. Uh, we might be filming some things for that. So if you want to be on the show or uh, any other kind of shows, whatever we do with that, that's an opportunity. Um, we've got episodes of group meeting uh, coming up. We've got fan tracks and other couple things coming up with that. Review points are coming for the few movies that are coming out for the rest of the summer that we're interested in. And if you're into wrestling, there's also smartoutmoment.com, and you can find our YouTube stuff and everything like that there as well. Uh, just pay attention to A Mango Tree. Lots of stuff coming off those branches. Okay. And Mr. Paid. Please support all the awesome stuff we got going on at Mega Powers Radio. This past week, we actually celebrated our one-year anniversary. We had a big party on Tuesday night where we featured the Roast of Tony Mango. So certainly go and check that one out. Lots of fun. We made jokes about each other, except for Dace, who didn't make jokes about anybody. <laughs> they didn't quite understand the concept of a roast. Uh, Dace Man Show also celebrated their one-year anniversary, so lots of fun went down this week. Uh, also check out another podcast that I have been running the past couple months about Game of Thrones. It's called Sand and Snow, available on Fanboys Anonymous and Mega Powers Radio. If you're into that series, please check it out where we talk about it, comparing it to the books. And now that the season is over, we're going to be trying to find some unique things to fill in the time in between to keep your Game of Thrones fix filled until Season 5 starts up next year. Please stay tuned with us because we will do that for you. And... I should also plug this one out there. The next Four Real Movie Club will actually be giving the reins to me a little bit. I'll be doing Americana movies, American Pride, America, America, because uh, we're going to do a Fourth of July weekend, which is actually two weeks away, because we got to get our shit together for that. Mm-hmm. I haven't fully picked all the movies yet. I know I definitely want to do The Patriot and Apollo 13. I have two more spots open as far as movies that I want to do, so got to figure out those. If you have suggestions, please drop them on the comments of this video. And, yeah, thanks for having me on, Dace. Not a problem. Always a pleasure to have you guys here. Uh, as for me, follow me on Twitter, at the Dace Man. Check out everything we're doing at fanboysanonymous.com. Like Tony said, we will be at the Too Many Games Festival convention thinger this weekend coming up um, in Phoenixville, PA. Uh, check out oldtimewrestling.net. Yours truly just got done a night show last night. Our next one's July 12th. And check out everything else that's going on in the world of fanboys and fun stuff. Uh, for everybody here at the Four Real Movie Club, Mike Payton, Tony Mango, myself, and everybody else with the Mega Powers Radio and Fanboys and Anonymous Family, thank you for tuning in. Keep on watching movies and make sure you're part of the Four Real Movie Club. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. I'm too old for this. Good day, sir! You stay classy, San Diego. Rose? Well, we're going, we don't need Rose. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'm finished. That little pig. I don't go. Hasta la vista, baby. Hey, everybody! We're all gonna get late! You're still here? It's over. Go home.